So in this video, we're going to conclude our discussions about bonds and bond portfolios by specifically talking about the management of portfolios. But before we get to that point, we need to discuss a little bit more about interest rates. And in this case, we're talking about the impact of interest rates on the portfolios that we might hold or that the, of the bonds that we hold. So we're going to look at several measurements now of risk that's related to interest rates. So we're gonna talk about that sensitivity, how we measure it, and then of course in the end we will conclude um, our videos on bonds, etc., with some discussion about passive and active kinds of strategies. So let's think first about interest rate sensitivity. We know the bond prices and yields are inversely related. So an increase in the bond's yield to maturity leads to smaller price changes than a decrease in equal magnitude. Essentially what that's saying is, look, if, if, a, if, a, if a bond has an increase in yield to maturity, that, that means that the price is going to fall. But that fall is going to be a smaller amount than of the decreased amount of a similar type of bond. So what we're talking about here is that dependent on the characteristics of bonds, there will be different levels of changes in price as interest rates change. Long-term bonds tend to be more price sensitive than short-term bonds. As maturity increases, when we're looking at longer-term bonds compared to smaller-term bonds, price sensitivity goes up, but it goes up at a decreasing rate. So longer bonds are more price sensitive than shorter bonds, but that sensitivity itself is not as intense as you get to longer and longer times away from today. Interest rate risk is inversely related to the bond's coupon rate. So that means if the bond has a high coupon rate, Typically, it's going to have lower interest rate risk. And then finally, price sensitivity is inversely related to the yield to maturity at which the bond is currently selling. So again, high yield to maturity bonds are typically going to have low price sensitivity. So how we know this or how we gather this information is through a, a sort of a statistic, if you will. And the statistic is called duration. It's a measure of the effective maturity of a bond. It's kind of like a payback period, if you will. It's the weighted average of the times until the payments actually receive. And then those weights are proportional to the present value of the payment. Now those two sentences make absolutely no sense, right? We need to see a formula. We'll look at that here in a second. But duration it's, is equal to the maturity for zero coupon bonds. Again, if you think about this, since we're talking about a payback period, if your only payback is when you get the bond in the future, then that is, if, if that's the only payback in a zero coupon bond, duration equals maturity. Since everything else has a coupon and you're getting cash in be between now and maturity, that means that the, ma the duration of any coupon bond has to be less than the maturity for a similar lifespan of zero coupon bond. So let's look at this formula because it's, it's, it's a kind of a strange um, it's kind of a strange mishmash of, of concepts here. So let's talk about W here, right? If you take the cash flow, those are the coupons in each period. If you divide that by one minus the yield to maturity to the teeth power. So every year, every cash flow that's paid, we're going to have a cash flow and we'll have this formula of Y and T. We divide that by the price of the bond. That gives us W sub T. So we'll have one of these calculations. If we assume annual 
uh, payment of coupons. If there were 30 of them, we'd have 30 of these calculations. Then each one of these calculations is multiplied by T. So the very first one, 1 times WT. But the second version of WT is going to be multiplied by 2. So it's what? 2 times W sub 2. Again, we calculate all of those and then we add them all together and that's what gives us duration. So what is this relationship? The change in price is proportional to duration. So the change in price divided by price, right? So this is just a percentage here, equals negative duration because we know if the change in price is positive, then the ultimate change in uh, has to be negative if the yield change. Multiply that by the change in yield divided by, again, this is just a percent change in yield. So if we want to get something called the modified duration, it's just a variation, if, if you will. But D star here is the duration divided by 1 plus the yield to maturity. It's just a simplified formula. So ultimately then the change in price is negative D, that negative modified duration times the percent change in yield. So let's look at this bond that we've been calculating all along. We find out that the first number we calculate here is Machiavelli's duration. That's the formula we had before the first one. Modified duration is the number we want to use. So in this case, it's 19.90. Get some more decimals. What if there is a percent change in yield to maturity? What if the bond increases yield to maturity by 0.02%? What happens to the value or the price of this bond? 0.02 multiplied by the modified duration gives us a percent change in value of negative 0.02%. Four, zero. Now these are obviously rounded off because there's a little bit of difference there. So the new price is going to be $747.01. So that gives us again this idea or this concept of the change in price. We know if the yield goes up, the price goes down. And it goes from $750 to $747. So what are the basic rules of duration? A zero coupon, it's equal to its time to maturity. <clears throat> if we hold maturity constant, duration is higher if the coupon rate is lower. If you hold the coupon rate constant, a bond's duration generally increases with its time to maturity. Holding all factors constant, the duration of a coupon bond is higher when the bond's yield to maturity is lower. So if we have a coupon bond, a high coupon bond with a, um, um, it, it, excuse me, it's higher for a coupon bond, it's a high rate if the yield to maturity is lower. So the lower the yield to maturity, the higher the duration is going to be. And likewise, if we had a, a, a duration of a perpetuity, that duration would be equal to 1 plus y divided by y. Again, this rule we're never going to use except for in research contexts. But um, again, it is the fifth rule, if you will, of duration. So again, we understand duration. Duration is a measure of interest rate risk. The bigger the number, the greater the sensitivity the bond has to interest rates. Now, the one thing about duration is the duration is a good measure only for small changes in bond yields, but duration is also a measurement of a linear bond price um, and yield relationship. And we know that that relationship is not linear. It is curvilinear. There's a curve. We saw a picture of this earlier. So one of the things we understand now is this blue line is the actual 
duration. The dotted line here is, is the, what duration approximates. So you can see that for some of these numbers in between, duration in, is going to do a pretty good job. But as we get further and further away from zero here, right, as we get further and further, we're going to find that the actual change is much different than what duration says. So to solve that, we have some calculus. So here is another statistic that's called convexity. Convexity corrects for the curvilinear nature of prices and time or and interest rates. So again, you can look at the formula. It's obviously a, a pretty ugly formula, right? But we can calculate this formula. I almost said simply, but we can calculate it. And now we end up with our corrected formula. So the change in price is negative D times the change in yield plus one half of the complexity times the change in yield squared. Again, that is going to give us a picture uh, or a, a, an answer that in the end reflects the actual curvilinear nature of the, of the problem. So if we go back up here to our uh, previous slide, you can see convexity is 660.1496. It's a big number. Again, it is there to adjust for the curvilinear nature of the problem. So the percentage change in value, again, it's, since it's such a small number, and again, we're very close, then it's essentially came out a slightly different price, 747.02. So if we were to make bigger changes in yield to maturity, we would find much greater differences between these two numbers. But again, we're going to, it's easy. If you're going to do a formula, it's easy to calculate. If you know one thing, calculating the equation to get the, um, the answer, right? The correct answer is just a matter of a little bit of a formula. Higher convexity. Why do people like convexity? Why do we want this curvilinear nature? Bigger price increases when yields fall than, than losses when yields rise. So if, if prices, when interest rates are falling down, prices will go up faster than losses go down when yields rise. So uh, the, the very nature of convexity means when yields are falling, we're going to see much greater changes in price than if when interest rates were rising and bonds were falling. The more volatile interest rates are, the more attractive this asymmetry is. So bonds with greater convexity lead to higher prices and or lower yields with all else equal, right? So bonds have greater convexity, higher prices, and lower yields. So the next chapter we'll talk about, the next part of this chapter, we'll talk a little bit more about managing portfolios.